Hello everyone at the SIPS 2023 Summit in Panama, which emphasizes sustainability through science and technology. I'm Barry Marshall, Clinical Professor of Microbiology at the University of Western Australia in Perth. You might recall that Dr. Warren and I won the 2005 Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of Helicobacter pylori. And maybe you also recall that a lot of that work was consolidated at the University of Virginia, where I was a research fellow in geographic medicine under the guidance of my lifelong friend and mentor, Dr. Richard Garant, who successfully chaired the Department of Geographic Medicine there, and who invited me to say a few words here today at SIPS 2023. So Dick, thanks again, and I hope to meet you again soon, as we did recently in Virginia. You recall that one of the highlights of that visit was the university's History of Medicine Library featuring the Dr. Walter Reed collection. Walter Reed's team proved that mosquitoes spread yellow fever, and thanks to his efforts, it was possible to build the Panama Canal more than a century ago. I get a lot of kudos from the story of my self-experiment, drinking live helicobacter. But of course the yellow fever experiments were far more dramatic and not everybody survived. So please have Dick arrange a visit to the Walter Reed exhibition if you ever visit him at UVA in Charlottesville, Virginia. Most certainly Panama is a historic place to hold the SIPS 2023 conference and it must be on everybody's bucket list, including mine, as a site of global importance for all our economies and as a site for creating sustainable new science and technology. So thank you for inviting me to give a short talk today on precision medicine for Helicobacter pylori. I wanted to talk about the development because I think there's so much data now in the literature that it's difficult for one person to be able to survey the whole field and much better if we just understand the basic principles, how we came to these conclusions, and then give you a little update on the things that we're interested in in this year. Just to acknowledge my good colleague, Dr. Robin Warren, and here we are together after winning the Nobel Prize in 2005 at the University of Western Australia. This next slide is going to show you the picture of Helicobacter pylori as they were first seen by Dr. Warren way back in 1979. And he stained them with a silver stain so the bacteria are black and you can see them very easily against the yellow tissues. Now the point I want to make to you here is that Helicobacter lives on the surface of the gastric mucosa. So it's very difficult for the immune system to eradicate Helicobacter, that's one issue. But on the other hand, the bacteria are very susceptible to any kind of drug or medication which the patient swallows. And I'm going to talk about bismuth in a minute. But just to remind you that bismuth can reach concentrations of thousands of micrograms per mil and quickly eradicate 99% of Helicobacter. And I'll show you some data on that. Once more, I just want to emphasize the number of treatment papers that are in the literature for Helicobacter pylori. But in the last 10 years, we've had about a thousand papers every year on treatment. And if you see 2019, there were 737 papers on Helicobacter treatment. So let's get started. <coughs> and I want you to think about Helicobacter pylori treatment this way. Firstly, antibiotic agents which can be reused. And these are primarily bismuth, amoxicillin, tetracycline and possibly furazolidone. The point I want to make is that H. pylori hardly ever becomes resistant to these. So that means if the patient failed a treatment with amoxicillin, you could give amoxicillin again in a different combination. The organism would still be sensitive. Same with bismuth and tetracycline. Resistant Helicobacter pylori to these agents is so rare that we always think it's a, you know, a false result by uh, a laboratory error. Uh, people can argue about this, and maybe the genomic studies are going to give us more information. Now, let's talk about bismuth and metals. I just want to remind you that heavy metals have been used in the treatment of different infections, particularly spiral organisms, mucosal infections, 
for hundreds of years. And you'll see that in the table of the elements, the column under nitrogen and phosphorus goes nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth. So all those heavy metals were very important for the treatment of infections before we had antibiotics, even going back more than 200 years. On the top there, you see a picture of bismuth crystals or bismuth metal as, as it uh, appears normally. It's quite heavy. Uh, and mercury, arsenic and bismuth have been used to treat syphilis primarily. But any curved spiral mucosal microaerophilic organism can probably be treated with these products. A little bit of note about mercury. It was one of the first treatments for syphilis uh, and it was somewhat toxic and uh, mercurials used to be used as diuretics as well. So if you could avoid the toxicity, so experienced practitioners could give people mercury in a dose which was enough to suppress or eliminate syphilis, surprisingly. The next important one was arsenic, and Paul Ehrlich, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1908 for immunologic studies. But in fact, the other thing that he invented was arsphenamine, which he called the first magic bullet for syphilis. Uh, and here's his treatment kit. You'll see he's got some arsphenamine there uh, in the um, uh, glass vial. And at the top, you'll see an intravenous infusion set. So I suppose he was going to, uh, the glass bottle at the top there was filled up with water. And then he pulverized the uh, arsphenamine in the little dish there and he mixed it with the water and gave it to the patients. And this kind of treatment for syphilis was used right up until the invention of penicillin after World War II, after 1948. And apparently it was quite successful. Patients used to have the IV treatment and they would be unwell for about a week and then they would recover and go home and presumably were cured. The other one of interest, also used for the treatment of syphilis, by the way, but now we used a lot for H. pylori, was bismuth. So bismuth was described in 1555 by this guy, Georgius Agricola, and he produced a book called De Metallica in which he described purification and isolation of all kinds of metals, metallurgy. And uh, unfortunately, his famous book was published one year after his death. So he died after about 60 years of age. <clears throat> but here you see in this diagram on the right hand side, various uh, illustrations uh, showed the preparation of uh, bismuth. And at the bottom, you'll see some kind of brick kiln, uh, which was used to burn charcoal and after it was nice and hot they would then throw in the bismuth rocks which is there under number C and then uh, they would put more fire on top of it and presumably that removed uh, all the oxides and left the bismuth metal which flowed out in the bottom and at the top right hand side you can see kind of trenches uh, long things there with fire on them and the bismuth used to run out the bottom and eventually uh, in this diagram where you see B, uh, you see these uh, pellets of bismuth, which were uh, the final product. And that was used then to make various bismuth compounds. Now he didn't talk too much about bismuth treatment. It wasn't for another hundred years that we started to see bismuth treatment in the literature. Now in the acid stomach, bismuth is changed to bismuth oxychloride, which is an insoluble compound, but it mixes or even chelates with proteins in the gastric mucus layer. So bismuth oxychloride and most bismuth salts bind to mucus. They're not absorbed, but they can cause black stools because that's a, a bismuth sulfide compound. And in various studies, it's been shown that uh, bismuth salts, particularly bismuth subsalicylate, which is the one used mostly in the United States, uh, will kill or detach bacteria from the mucosa. So even uh, pathogenic E. coli causing, say, traveler's diarrhea, probably detach from the mucosa and the uh, diarrhea has helped quite a lot. So bismuth salts have been used in bismuth medicine for a long time. So this diagram just shows the many different compounds and I can name a few bismuth subnitrate, bismuth subsalicylate, bismuth subcitrate, and most of them end up being bismuth oxychloride in the gastric mucosa. So the interesting thing is that bismuth is trivalent and once it's free in the mucosa, uh, 
these uh, spare valences can link to peptides. And so bismuth is taken up, particularly by an organism, organism like H. pylori, which has an alkaline environment around it, and the bismuth will cross-link various proteins and inactivate some of the important surface enzymes, I guess, of H. pylori. So there is a literature on that, uh, but it's a bit hard to follow in places. It's done by chemists. There seems to be a bismuth fan club, and here's a review article in Inorganic Chemistry, Bismuth, the Magic Element. Um, so once again, uh, it talks about all these things uh, that bismuth can do, and they make the statement, the remarkable fact as noted earlier that bismuth is the heaviest non-radioactive metal in the periodic table and is practically non-toxic. So this motivates the development of a wealth of variants of potential value in medicine and healthcare. So just remember that, it's practically non-toxic, and I'll talk about that a bit in the future. But uh, when I see warnings about bismuth, I say, well, there's no data showing that there's any toxicity from bismuth, except in very rare cases. So in the United States, where I said, uh, we have Pepto-Bismol, which has been used for 100 years for things such as gastritis and uh, diarrhea. Now, you and I know that um, uh, Helicobacter and Campylobacter are very common illnesses, and so you can see why people might be taking uh, Pepto-Bismol in the United States. Bismuth subsalicylate products are not recommended for patients younger than 12 years because of a lack of studies to prove efficacy in young children, but mostly it's safe. There is some concern about uh, children with fevers, uh, two-year-olds, for example, and salicylate causing a rare syndrome called Reyes syndrome. So we have to watch out for that, uh, but nearly everybody else can take Pepto-Bismol. I'll remind you that this is over the counter in the United States. You can buy it in the supermarket and in so many, many years, uh, I've hardly ever seen reports of toxicity from Pepto-Bismol. Probably the salicylate part is the toxic part, not the bismuth. My interest in bismuth started when I read this paper, 1981. Difference in relapse rates of duodenal ulcer after healing with cimetidine or tripotassium dicitrobismuthate. So I'll just call that bismuth citrate. In uh, some countries, it's called denol. And what they did was they healed the ulcers with either bismuth or cimetidine. And it was a double blind, placebo control, everything. Uh, and you see everybody's got healed ulcers at this point, 100%. There. And uh, then they just stopped treatment, followed people up for 18 months. And what they found here was firstly with cimetidine, there was 70% relapse in 18 months after they stopped their cimetidine. So the ulcer would heal, but nearly always recur. But amazingly, in patients who had their ulcer healed with the bismuth, and remember, bismuth hardly has any effect, effect on acid secretion, so it wasn't a, a H2 blocker or acid blocker or anything. Uh, they healed their ulcers just the same, but there was only 40% relapse in the bismuth group after 18 months. So that was pretty amazing. And so really, 60% of the patients treated with bismuth were cured of their ulcer. Nobody could really believe this paper. Uh, and so uh, no one could figure out why that was. But we were doing research on helicobacter, so uh, obviously we're thinking, hey, this could only be explained if bismuth kills H. pylori. And we did some experiments in vivo and in vitro, and here you see on the left-hand side a disc with bismuth subsalicylate actually. Uh, showing a very sharp demarcation. We know that the MIC for bismuth on helicobacter is only about 12 micrograms per mil. So it's almost as good as penicillin. And on the right-hand side, you see we, we did this uh, study where we gave some volunteers bismuth and then took some gastric biopsies 30 minutes later. And here you see the bismuth attaching to the uh, organisms. They're taking the bismuth in, so they're staining very darkly and they are becoming detached from the mucosal epithelial cells. Others have found the same thing, and more recently, here's a paper by Professor Doré and David Graham. The role of bismuth in, in improving H. pylori eradication with triple therapy. And this is levofloxacin and levofloxacin triple therapy and levofloxacin with bismuth. And the important things are that 
If the organism was susceptible in the first place to liver floxacin, cure rate was high. And that was like amoxicillin levofloxacin PPI. Uh, but if the organism was resistant to levofloxacin, the treatment only had a 37.5% cure rate. But if they added bismuth, you'll see the cure rate was now 70.6. So you, depending on the resistance known in your community, if you add bismuth to a levofloxacin resistant problem, uh, quite often you can still eradicate the H. pylori. Uh, this has been noted by other people. I remember Tom Barodi in Sydney told me many years ago that if you gave bismuth and metronidazole, it often eradicated the metronidazole resistant organisms. That was actually bismuth, metronidazole and tetracycline in that discussion. So in China also, bismuth has been shown to enhance the quadruple therapies. And here's a table, you don't need to read the table, I'm just gonna show you a couple of the highlights. And the thing that I notice from this table is that if you give more PPI and more bismuth, you'll get a higher cure rate. And also if you give a longer duration of therapy, you'll get a higher cure rate. So I just highlighted a few there. And you see a great study in Shanghai. This is uh, the best treatment I could find here. Uh, Shanghai, 220 milligrams twice a day of bismuth. So that's two tablets twice a day in the Chinese doses. Uh, 500 milligrams twice a day of clarithromycin, quite a good dose of clarithromycin. Amoxicillin, one, gra one gram twice a day. And the PPIs uh, on this one, omeprazole, 20 milligrams BID for 14 days. I would use more than that, actually. I'd use isomeprazole, lansoprazole, or rabeprazole, uh, and in quite high doses. So uh, you'll see they gave the treatment, though, for 14 days and they got 94% eradication on intention to treat. So that was like every patient. It was difficult for patients to fail treatment. Probably the few non-compliant patients who took that intermittently as they usually do and still got eradication. So 94% eradication. If you can get eradication above 94%, that means you might treat quite a few patients before you see a failure. So I like that Shanghai treatment, 14 days. 94% eradication, even in an area where we know there's lots of resistance. So remember that antibiotic resist resistance is rising everywhere. And here's some data uh, from the United States, a bit of a review article, and we see the same kind of thing in China. Metronidazole always been a problem, and uh, metronidazole is 60 or 70% resistant in most places. So a difficult situation. Now on this graph, you'll see the shadings, and that makes the point that as soon as resistance gets above 20% with these drugs, they become difficult to use, and you would avoid them if possible. So metronidazole, no good. Clarithromycin, it used to be very beautiful, but now uh, we're seeing resistance above 20% in quite a few places, so that means your cure rate's gonna get down towards 70 or 80%. And finally, levofloxacin quickly became resistant in most places, and now we're seeing high resistance rates, 30%. I think in Australia, it's not so much because there are restrictions on the use of quinolones uh, and the government uh, doesn't recommend them as first line treatment. So they are still useful in patients with, with resistant gram negative organisms. So in summary then, as we get towards the end of my talk, uh, there's a few new treatments that give cure rates 80% to 90% in my opinion. Here's one uh, called Talesia, and that's Omeprazole, Amoxicillin, and Rifabutin. Now, uh, Rifabutin has been used as a second line additive uh, to treatments, and I've used it quite a lot. Um, it does have a few side effects, but the dose of Rifabutin in this treatment, Talesia, is less than I have usually used. And so maybe the side effects are quite tolerable. Uh, remember, with when you treat people with a lot of antibiotics, you'll find that 30% of them will have some side effects. So you need to keep in touch with the patients and make sure they can contact you or the GI fellow uh, at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in case there's some kind of allergy or idiosyncratic reaction to the antibiotics that you're giving. The other one, uh, that's well known is Pylera, and again, that's a good one. It has bismuth, uh, 140 milligrams, metronidazole, 125 milligrams, and tetracycline. And I told you once before that if you give bismuth and tetracycline together, 
then it overcomes metronidazole resistance in quite a few patients. And of course, you can give that with the PPI. But there's hope on the horizon now because we have a new type of very strong acid blocker called a PCAB, which means potassium competitive acid blocker. It's even stronger than isomeprazole and the ones that we know and seems to be quite safe. So the data is coming out now and we show in the table, it's very complicated, so I'm gonna show you the next bit. Uh, but quite a few studies are coming out to show that this drug can potentiate the effect of amoxicillin. So we might even be getting towards two drug therapies once again. So if I show you some detail on that, which I like, you'll see that this is a study where they're using vonoprazan, which is that PCAB, amoxicillin and clarithromycin, 400 milligrams twice a day of the clarithromycin. And here you see the cure rate is 87.3% in a sensitive organism. And in a resistant organism, this combination now reaches 82.9%. So the suggestion is that if you could have this combination, uh, the H. pylori would be sensitive once again. I'm not sure whether this was initial treatments or subsequent treatments, but it does tell us that if you have very strong acid blockade, then these compounds such as amoxicillin work much better and may overcome some of the resistance. So I think we're going to see more data on these drugs in the future. And you may see other PCABs, uh, which will be released in the next year or two. There's one other take home message that I will give you. And you can tell your patients this. The only cure for Helicobacter is precision antibiotic therapy. Natural therapies in every country ineffective. TCM is ineffective. Probiotics, ineffective. Garlic, mastic gum, manica honey, it's a waste of money. And single antibiotics are ineffective, but we might have to change that last line sometime in the future. Gracias.